All right. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year to uh, everybody on Facebook and Instagram. We got the, uh, no, where am I at? I'm YouTube. YouTube over here and Facebook over here. It's hard to keep all y'all straight, man. There's so many. There's like so many places to be. Um, yeah, let me uh, angle these a little better. How about that? All right, now we're in the middle on both of y'all. Hey, everybody. New year, new uh, new technical uh, stuff. <laughs> um, so is everybody doing okay on their New Year's resolutions so far? We're like January, what, 8th or something? <laughs> I don't have a watch. I don't know why I did that. I don't even own a watch. Um, I think we're, what, January 8th or something? Eight days in, seven days in, something like that? Everybody broken their resolution so far? Just me? All right, good. Um, so, yeah, what were your New Year's resolutions? Did anybody resolve to practice more? Yeah, it's usually a good, uh, it's a good idea. If you're going to make a resolution every year, uh, your res one of your resolutions every year should be to practice more than you did the year before. What's up, Thomas Jenkins? We were talking about you earlier. Uh, we we're just suggesting maybe uh, you might want to practice your French horn. Um, so uh, yeah, I made some quip earlier about uh, French horn practice and how that was a very silly thing to do. Um, just stick your hand in there further. Any mistakes, you'll just, you won't hear them. Um, so yeah, if your resolution was to practice more, uh, that's good. You should. You should practice more. We should all practice more, especially Thomas. Um, so if ever, there's so many pressures on everybody's time right now, right? It's 2020, and it's just we're all expected to be in uh, 300 places at a time, and there's so much to do, and it's like all this technology is here supposedly to help us be more productive, but in a lot of cases, it's sort of working against us, right? So sometimes we have to just we have to really think about how are we going to best utilize our time and if we want to practice more and obviously you want to practice more but you also want to practice smarter and and it's everything is always about being more efficient with your time uh no come on in if you're if you're at the electric violin shop you're at the right place somebody just walked in we're we're like an operating retail store come on in it's fine somebody back behind the counter help you okay, thank all you. right there's thousands of people watching right now but it's cool well, there's tens of people watching. All right. So, um, yeah, we want to utilize our time well, right? So Andy Pastor actually sent me some thoughts that he had on this. This whole thing was his idea. Hey, could you talk about how to be a more efficient practicer? Um, and then he, he was also kind enough to basically give me the entire outline. So if you guys want me to talk about a topic, that's how you do it. You send me uh, you send me an email. You basically write the entire outline for me, and then... Uh, Maybe I'll give the talk. Uh, yeah, that helped me to be more efficient. Somebody else did all the work. Um, so one of his first thoughts was setting up a practice space to minimize your setup time. So if you've got a designated spot in your house or your apartment or your studio or wherever where that's where you practice and everything just sort of always stays at least a little bit out so that from the time you decide that you're going to practice, to the time that you're playing, if we can minimize that amount of time, then that helps increase the amount of A, time that you spend practicing and the likelihood that you're gonna go in that room, right? If you know there's 15 minutes of work ahead of you before you're gonna be able to practice, you're like, oh man, I don't know if I get the case down and the lights out, and blah, blah, blah. no. If you, if you can walk in and just start playing, then you're in great shape. Um, so, uh, if you can have a mirror in your practice room, that is super helpful. I actually like using a camera for a variety of reasons, and we'll uh, we'll talk about those later. But if you have already have a tripod set up for yourself or a camera stand or whatever, uh, or a mirror, either one, have all that set up. Have your instrument hanging on the wall so that you don't have to get into a case, you don't have to do all these things. If everything is set up to minimize the amount of time from decision until practicing, that's good, right? Um, another thing to think about if you are like, man, I'd like to practice an hour a day, but I don't have one contiguous hour within my day. Um, well, maybe you can find 30 minutes in the morning and you can find 30 minutes in the evening. It turns out, as long as we're not being wasteful with setup and teardown time, that multiple sessions is better than one session anyway. It gives your brain more time 
to process these things that you are practicing. It gives you, um, it's just, it's more efficient. And there's been studies to show this, that multiple shorter practice sessions throughout the day are better for you in general than one long practice session. Okay, I think there's probably a minimum, and I don't know what the research is behind that. Maybe somebody like uh, David Wallace is going to know. Um, by the way, those of you who are fans of the Rockstar Violinist podcast, I'll tell you, it's usually a secret who's coming out next, but I'll tell you guys because we're all friends. Um, the next Rockstar Violinist podcast episode that's coming out will be out in about a week. Uh, it's Dr. David Wallace, who is the chairman of the string department at Berkeley College of Music. Huh, that guy might know something. So he is one of the most amazing string teachers I've ever been around. It's his, it's his whole job to figure out how am I best going to teach people to be more creative, to be better players, to be better human beings, because that's those are tied together. And um, it's a really fascinating conversation. I'm really enjoying uh, working through the editing on this. Um, but I digress. Um, yeah, multiple sessions is better than one session. I'm sure there's a minimum amount of time, probably 15 or 20 minutes, that you certainly want to play at least 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you know, to say that 61-minute sessions is just as good as one hour, I don't know that that's uh, quite true. But, but two 30-minute sessions might be better than one contiguous hour, okay? And each person's a little different. But just as you're trying to get your practice time up, Consider that possibility. Well, I've only got 30 minutes here and 30 minutes here. That's cool. That's fine. Um, the other thing about your personality that comes into this is whether you want to have specific drills, like you're a really structured person, you want to have a list, maybe a whiteboard or something in your practice room that you've written out. Okay, long tones, spiccato, I'm going to work some scales, do arpeggios and all those kinds of things. Maybe you're gonna work through each of those in order and that's the way that you just, I like to be regimented, I like to do things in this order and that's fine, that's great. Um, I couldn't live like that, I'd put a bullet in my head. Um, I might have a list on a whiteboard in my practice room that has, hey, I need to work on these 10 different things right now. And I sit down and I go, yeah, I'm in the mood to do number four. So I'm gonna work through some of that. But I've always got that list sort of sitting there as I'm working on number four or whatever that is. Those, those things are always kind of in front of me. And as I sort of feel, okay, I feel like I'm getting my right hand a little looser today, that's good. Well, I've got these other things I need to hit too. So it's always reminding me of what things I need to work on. And maybe I won't hit each of those things in every practice session, but um, it's good for me to have those things in front of me so that I know all right, these are the things that are in front of me. They've got to get done today. So, yeah, it's not a bad idea to have a whiteboard or a uh, if a piece of paper or whatever, however you like keeping, keeping track of stuff. Um, have one of those in your practice room to remind you, either if you're a regimented person, and that's fine. I don't understand you, but that's fine. Um, these are the things that I do in order. Or like me, hey, here's my list to pick and choose from. Um, if you like to play with tracks, or a metronome, and you should like to practice with at least one of those. Um, it's good to have something in your practice room where, again, a minimum of setup time where it's just sitting there. Maybe you've got a physical metronome, like my mom always had one on the piano at home, like the little wooden pyramid that you push the thing, it'll... right? I can hear that in my sleep. Um, maybe you've got a physical metronome sitting in there. Maybe it's an app on your phone. Maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a, you've got a, a click track on, on Logic pulled up on your computer all the time. Whatever you need to do that, to play with tracks, or if you need to, uh, where to find jazz licks and scales, other Berkeley stuff for just, um, good question. I'll get to that in a little bit, I think. Um, so if you want to play with tracks or play with a metronome, have a little setup in your office or your practice space where that's just easy to do. It's not like, oh, I got it three minutes and boot up the computer and all that. It's helpful. The quicker it is, the more likely you are to do it. Um, now, why would we want to play along with tracks? Um, a, they help your intonation. They help your timing. Tracks are going to work with timing the same way a, uh, a metronome does. Those tracks are all recorded with a quick track. So they're always going to be 
right there, and you're gonna have to play in there. And if you feel like that track or that metronome is speeding up and slowing down, it's not the metronome, it's you. So it's gonna help your timing. The more that you play with something that's, that's hitting, you know, every 60 BPM or whatever, the more you do that, the more your internal clock is gonna get synchronized and you're gonna learn how to play without rushing or dragging. Um, I actually, actually toured with a guy one time. We called him the Russian Dragon because he was always either Russian or Dragon. And uh, he thought he had this really cool name. Like, yeah, I'm the Russian Dragon. <laughs> sure, buddy. You want to be proud of that? That's great. Um, so if you, if you want to use YouTube, YouTube has tens of thousands of tracks to play along with. Um, Drones tracks, if you want to play along to for your intonation, if we're in a Kia A today, you can pull up an A drone and it'll sit there and drone for 10 minutes and you can play your scales with that drone. Um, it's got click tracks on there, which I don't know why anybody throw a click track on YouTube, but somebody threw a click track on YouTube, God bless them, you can pull up whatever tempo you want. Um, if you're a Suzuki person, a lot of the Suzuki accompaniments are on YouTube and you can play along with those. Um, if you're an improviser, uh, there's tons of backing tracks on there and some of them, a lot of them will even show the chord that they're playing. Hey, we're on, you know, B minor seven and the one coming up is E. So you know what chord you're on and the one you're going to. If you're an improviser, you know why that's important. Um, there are jam tracks and play along tracks. If you're like, Hey, I want to play along with Lindsey Sterling Crystallize, um, then you can pull up a jam track to that, I assume. Never done that, but uh, if that's your thing, you can pull up it. I'm pretty sure you can pull up a jam track to that, and it has everything except the melody line, and you can just play along to that, and that's very helpful. Um, there are karaoke tracks. If you like, uh, you know, you like Journey and you want to play along to a Journey song, you can pull up a karaoke track to a Journey song, and you can play to your heart's content, okay? Um... There are also play along tracks for jazz standards, autumn leaves and all those kind of things. If you if you want to if you want to play along to uh, you know giant steps or whatever, that's all there in YouTube with these play along tracks. And, and all you have to do is put in the go to YouTube and type in the name of the song and then followed by either jam track or play along track or karaoke track, whatever. They're in there. There's tens of thousands of these things. Um, while you're doing that, if you're playing along to a track, it's not a bad idea to record yourself. Um, and that way you can, uh, you can sort of hear what you're doing. And we'll get into all that in a few minutes. Um, it's good to know what your particular learning style is. Um, if you're learning, so there's basically three learning styles. There's kinesthetic, visual, and auditory. A kinesthetic learner is one who learns by physically doing things. I've got to get these shapes under my finger, and once my fingers have done this shape 85,000 times, then it's there, okay? There are visual learners. I'm a visual learner. If I see something, that helps me a lot. Um, and then there's auditory learners. I, hey, if, if I can hear this thing, then I've got it, okay? So obviously, we all learn in each of those three methods, but, um, so we all each learn with all three methods, but generally each person will have a, uh, a preferred method that that's their thing. Um, so it's good to know which one of those is your thing. And then if you're trying to be efficient, then you're going to use that information to help you. Okay. Um, so if you, if you're a visual learner like me, it helps me to see the sheet music or to see the chord chart or whatever then maybe it's worth 10 minutes out of my day if I'm learning a new piece of music to go get that sheet music or to go get that chord chart. And then I've got that visually in front of me and the 10 minutes I spent to get that visual aid is gonna save me 30 minutes uh, versus trying to learn it by ear. Um, if you're an auditory learner and you've got the sheet music in front of you, maybe, and you're trying to learn a, a, a Bach partita, maybe go listen to Hilary Hahn or somebody play that and then your ear goes, oh, I know what I'm supposed to play now, right? Does that all make sense? So if you're trying to be efficient, don't fight it. Don't go, well, I should be able to learn it this way. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. The way you should be able, don't let anybody tell you the way you should be learning. You just know how you do learn, 
and use that to your advantage, okay? Um, learn what, if we talk about knowing yourself, uh, whether you want to have structure or you want to have sort of a loose schedule, if you're kinesthetic, visual, auditory, the other thing is to know what part of the day is best for you. Are you one of those early risers? Again, I don't understand you, but hey, that's, if that's your thing, God bless you. Um, if, if you're an early riser and you want to practice first thing in the morning, get up and practice first thing in the morning. If you're like me and you're a night owl and you want to practice at 1 a.m., practice at 1 a.m. So know who you are and, and use all of those things to your advantage in order to make your practice time more efficient. I could spend an hour on something at 7 a.m., and I'm not going to get as much out of it as if I spent 30 minutes on that thing at midnight. My brain is awake at midnight. My brain is not awake at 7 a.m. Um, I'm just fighting myself if I try to practice in the morning, okay? The, the biggest thing really is consistency. I would rather you practice 30 minutes a day all week than practice two and a half hours on one day, okay? Consistency is the key. So if you can find a routine, a space, a, a method, whatever it is that you can find that makes you want to do this every day, then that's going to help you. That's going to help you more than, well, I'm just going to cram all afternoon on Sunday uh, because I just couldn't bring myself to do this on Tuesday. It was just too big a hassle. Okay? So all of those things being said, that these are things that help make us more efficient players, um, I want to get into next, what are the advantages of using an electric? How does having an electric instrument help you? But I've got some questions to answer, uh, and then I'll get to the electric part. Somebody said something about JLP standards and all that. Yeah, some of those aren't going to be out there. There's not nearly as many. There's going to be more Satriani backing tracks than there are JLP backing tracks, probably because there's a zillion guitar players for every violinist. And uh, guys who play guitar tend to also play bass and drums um, so they can make their own backing tracks. Uh, it's much less common for violinists to be multi-instrumentalists, although there are a number of us out there. Um, but those are the guys who make backing tracks or the multi-instrumental guys because they just do it all themselves. Um, so yeah, uh, with Logic and with uh, some of the Reaper software and uh, some of these other softwares that are out there, I don't have to be able to play drums to be able to get a good drum beat. So um, yeah, you can make your own backing tracks if you want. It's really helpful to have all the chord changes if you can't just hear all that stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, so somebody did make the comment, yeah, that they've had to make all their own JLP backing tracks. Hey, man, if you want to be cool and you want to share those on YouTube, that'd be awesome. If you've made those backing tracks, throw it on a YouTube video and uh, stick it out there for the world to have. That'd be awesome. Um, what was somebody else asking here? Somebody said YouTube. Um, oh, Thomas Jenkins, here we go. Quist is a great backing track channel. Very true. Um, yeah, there, there are tons of great backing tracks on YouTube and, uh, oh, you're on SoundCloud. But if you want to throw a link in here so everybody can see that, that'd be, uh, that'd be really boss. Um, and this is somebody I'm talking to on the YouTube side for those of you on Facebook. Um, so, uh, I guess afterwards, if he's, if he throws up a link on the YouTube side, I'll copy that over and put it on the Facebook side. And then you guys can have a link to his SoundCloud page where he's sharing all these wonderful backing tracks. I haven't heard them, but you're watching us. You must be cool. So uh, yeah, I assume they're fantastic. Um, and if you guys have other tips that you want to throw in for making uh, practice time more efficient, I would, I would love to have those tips. Um, I certainly don't have all the answers on here. Andy Pastor might have all the answers. That's who, who basically wrote this, uh, wrote this outline for me. Um, but yeah. So, and then, so I took Andy Pastor's outline, which you just listened to, and, uh, and then I said, well, hey, how can an electric violin help in these areas? Well, one of the advantages when we talked about step one was to set up your practice space to minimize your setup time. Well, with an electric violin, you just leave it hanging on the wall all the time. If you live in a place where you've got a heater running in your house a lot and it dries the air out, you may not want to leave your very expensive acoustic violin hanging on the wall all the time um, because maybe it's too dry and you'd rather have it in a case with some humidity control. Uh, well, you know, my wife doesn't care. It doesn't care about humidity or any of that. I mean, if it's not too humid for a human being or it's not too dry for a human being, it's not too dry for a viper. 
Um, so the nice thing about the electric is you can just leave it sitting out all the time and you don't have to worry about humidity concerns. And you know, I, I don't have any uh, $50,000 instruments. You know, if you got a $50,000 instrument, you're probably not gonna leave it hanging on the wall because you know, maybe somebody's gonna walk by and bump into it. That'd be unfortunate. Um, so that's one advantage to electric. They're a little less expensive and you can leave them sitting out. They don't care about humidity as much. You can very easily record yourself. Uh, I talked about maybe wanting to have a camera instead of a mirror. Um, I've used this example before, but I'll, I'll use it again. Take your, uh, take your phone and put on voice memo or whatever and narrate yourself walking out to your mailbox and getting your mail. Okay, I'm walking down the stairs, sidewalk. Hey, look, there's some dog dude. Not going to step in that. Okay. And then, you know, just talk about what you're doing all the way to the mailbox and all the way back. Okay. Then listen back to that thing. And you are going to hear all kinds of things that you did not remember hearing. You'll hear cars going by. You'll hear, you know, Mrs. Jones that was next by. And she was like, hey, Matt. Okay, you're a jerk for ignoring me. Okay, yeah, I didn't hear any of that. I was busy talking to my phone. So the point being, when you're focused on a task, your brain filters out everything that it doesn't think is important. When you're focused on the task of playing the violin, your brain is filtering out things that it doesn't think is important, like bow noise, or hey, I accidentally pulled off of that D string and made a loud pong when I was trying to do some string crossings. When you listen back to yourself, or even better, you watch yourself back on a video, you're gonna see things and hear things that you did not see and hear while you were playing. That's why your teacher can always do a better job of evaluating your talent than you can. Because your teacher's not, their brain is not focused on playing the instrument, their brain is focused on watching you. So their brain isn't filtering out stuff that it doesn't think is important, like your wife. So my wife just posted on here. Yes, sometimes I ignore things that I don't think are important while I'm playing. And that might include you. I'm sorry. But you knew that already. Um, so um, yeah, she tolerates me. I don't know why, but she does. Um, so yeah, recording yourself is really helpful. So when you watch yourself back, five minutes of watching yourself play could be more helpful than 30 minutes of practicing. So... Just sort of think about that from an efficiency standpoint. Um, so I like setting up my phone to record myself. However, if I record myself into Logic, is which what I use, or if you're using Reaper or Pro Tools or whatever else you use, if you record yourself into that, you can see things in those waveforms that you cannot hear when you're listening to yourself. If you're if there's a click track going and you're playing you can see on the waveform, am I consistently ahead of that? Am I consistently behind that? Am I consistently on top of it? Um, so these are evaluation tools you can use for yourself that you could not do easily with an acoustic violin, unless you got a mic up in your room and all that. And then you're worried about, well, gosh, that waveform, was that my air conditioner kicking on or the dog barking or my wife telling me, uh, hey, I haven't seen you in three months because you practice too much. Um, so if you're plugged in, it's super easy to run to a digital audio workstation. You can see what the waveform is doing. Uh, you can see, gosh, I'm playing these notes much, much louder than these other notes. Being able to see the waveform on your screen is gonna tell you some things that you couldn't find out any other way. And the other thing is it helps you to check your intonation. Sometimes our ears can get fooled into thinking that things are not what they are. So if on most DAWs, there is a pitch correction plugin. The one on Logic actually will show you the note that you're supposedly playing, and it should be right. You should be at least that close. Um, and it will show you whether that note is flat or sharp. So if I'm watching the pitch correction plugin after the fact, don't record using a pitch correction, that's silly. Throw it on after the fact, and then it will basically just evaluate all of your playing that you just did. You can watch the little screen on the plugin and you're like, whoa, every time I play a D with my third finger on the A string, it's flat, huh? Apparently I need to stretch that finger out a little more. 
So these are things that the, that the electronics can help you with. And if you're using an electric instrument with a direct input to your computer, then you're getting a nice clean signal and the uh, computer is not going to be fooled by any ambience in the room or any of that. Okay, so you can see your waveforms, you can hear unintentional noises that you're making, and you can check your intonation with the pitch correction plugin. Okay, um, the other nice thing about an electric instrument, besides that you can hang it out, that you can easily record it, is it's quieter. My electric violins are way, way quieter than my acoustic violins. I mentioned that I'm a night owl. Um, so if I want to practice at one o'clock in the morning, I'm not waking up my kids. I'm not waking up my wife. I'm certainly not waking up my dog. Once he's asleep, that's, that's the end of that. Um, but yeah, it's a lot quieter. So you, it opens up the amount of times that you can practice. Um, do I have any tips on recording? Uh, yeah, maybe we'll get to that in a minute. Um, it opens up the options that you have for for timing during your day, right? If you've got a neighbor with a newborn baby and they're like, hey, between 10 and noon, could you just not make any noise? Well, if you got your electric violin, you're not bothering anybody. Um, same thing, if you're, an, if you're an early riser and you wanna get up at five, eight, there's, I guess there's a 5 a.m. Somebody told me one time. Um, if you wanna get up at 5 a.m. and practice, you're probably not gonna bother anybody. If you wanna practice at 1 a.m., you're probably not gonna bother anybody. So. Um, yeah, you can leave the violin out. It's easy to record it. It's quieter. Um, it's cooler. Um, so yeah, all those are advantages to having an electric violin uh, for making your practice time more efficient. Um, I don't know if anybody has any more questions about, hey, Blaze Keeler, what's going on, man? Blaze Keeler, the founder of Electric Violin Shop, is watching. Um, since he's here, I guess maybe I'll just tell all you guys, in case you didn't know, uh, the shop has been around, and maybe Blaze could even answer this for us. How long Electric Violin Shop has been around? I guess 15, more than 15 years, huh? Like, a while. I was like 12 or something. That's the story I'm going with. Um, <laughs> Jonathan knows 2009. Um, yeah, forever. Um, so Blaze started this shop, and uh, just built it basically to what it is today. And then he wanted to retire. He's got grandkids and bigger fish to fry. And um, so the full-time employees of the shop formed a co-op and bought it. So the inmates are truly running the asylum at this point. Um, it's great. I'm part-time and Shauna Tucker is part-time, but everybody else who works here is full-time. And uh, yeah, so I got a bunch of bosses, but uh, it's cool they all work here. So, pretty awesome. Um, Jonathan knows it because that's the year he was born. Dude, I got shoes older than you. It's crazy. Um, yeah, so, hey, uh, everybody salute Blaze for starting this place. And uh, thank you, man. Hope life is going well for you. Um, Jonathan had a question about recording. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I talked earlier about the Rockstar Violinist podcast. Um, the issue that's, or the, the episode, I guess we'll call it the episode, the episode that's coming out, sounded like I just had a thing. Um, the episode that came out three weeks ago uh, was with Matt Vanacoro. Matt Vanacoro is not a violinist, but we had him on the podcast anyway. There have been two, uh, oh, Music Explorium started in 1999 and had electrics from day one. How about that? So uh, how good is my math? 21 years. Look at there. Um, yeah, so Matt Vanicoro is not a keyboard player. We have entered, or he's not, he is a keyboard player. He's not a violinist or a cellist or a violist. Um, of the almost 40 people that we've interviewed, there have been two who don't play violin. Matt Vanicoro is one. Anybody know the other one? Anybody watching? Drop it in the comments section if you know who the other person we've interviewed who is not a violinist or violist or cellist, who's not a string player. Um, but the reason we thought it was worthwhile to interview Matt for the Rockstar Violinist podcast is because um, he is a sound engineer and owns a studio. And he also, he's Mark Wood's piano player. So if, if you tour with Mark Wood, you're probably going to pick up a thing or two about violin. And... Uh, Matt has recorded tons and tons of violinists, uh, people that we talked to, Earl Manian and Joe Denizon and David Wallace 
and uh, he engineered my album that just came out. And he's he's recorded tons and tons of string players. So he had a lot to talk about as far as recording technology. It is, Raz. Good job. Uh, Ned Steinberger was the other person. So if you want to know about recording, if you want to know about engineering, if you want to know about sponsorships, relationships with uh, companies, uh, Matt probably has more sponsorships than anybody I know. Um, that is a really fantastic episode to listen to. And um, I couldn't possibly in 15 minutes give a better summary than Matt did in that podcast. So please go listen to that. It's on soundcloud.com slash electric violin shop or soundcloud.com slash rockstar violinist. Um, it's the most recent thing we've put on there. So the Matt Vanicoro episode is totally worth an hour out of your day to listen to, and you will learn more about sponsorships and recording and mics and preamps and how to prep a room and all those. Excuse me. Love me some cookout. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic episode, and it's worth listening to. Raz Palumbi's here. I'm going to be hanging out with Raz next week at the NAM show in Anaheim. Um, and she's right. Ned Steinberger was the other person we interviewed who is not a string player, but Ned Steinberger um, is probably one of the more important people in amplified music, guitar, bass, violins, uh, cellos, violas. It just He's a really important dude in the history of rock and roll. Um, and so, yeah, we interviewed him. Uh, the NAM show is happening next week. Um, so I will not be here next Wednesday. I will actually be in the air on my way to Anaheim. Um, oh, we definitely, yeah, we need to do an after party AMA. So if you guys are going to the NAM show in Anaheim, um, it starts a week from tomorrow. Holy crap. It starts a week from tomorrow. Um, if you're going to be there Friday night, from seven to nine, we're having a fiddle hang. Everybody's invited. If you are a string player, if you like a string player, if you know what a string player is, um, come to the fiddle hang. It is at the Anaheim Packing District, which is a venue, uh, from seven to nine on Friday the 17th, I think. Um, I noticed, I noted that I'm a free spirit. I don't memorize calendar dates. Um, it's Friday. Um, Patrick Contreras is going to play, and oh my God, if you have not heard Patrick play, holy cow. Um, so uh, Raz is going to be there. I'm going to be there. Um, Drew Ford, that viola kid, he's going to be there. I think Brian King Joseph's going to be there. Ned Steinberger, we just talked about, is going to be there. Mark Wood's probably going to be there. Hayden Vitera is going to be there. Um, Hopefully, Jenny Luke and and uh, and all that all her LA crowd is going to be there. Uh, Jesus Florido is going to be there. Andrew Glasser is going to be there. Uh, Steve Carlson from Zeta is going to be there. There's like so many cool cats going to be at this thing. Last year, uh, I got to see a couple. I got to introduce a couple of people. I got to introduce Martha Mook to Rob Flax is going to be there. Dang, look at there, Rob Flax is here. Uh, Steven's going to be there. Um, I got to introduce Martha Mook to Black Violin. Those guys, Martha is like one of the OGs of electric viola. Black violin are these guys, they're an overnight success that have been working at this for 20 years. Um, but they're now blowing up. They headlined the, uh, the Yamaha stage last year, which is a huge honor. Um, and then like two months later, I see Martha and Black Violin, who are both Eventide artists, release this uh, collaboration they did. And I would like to think that maybe I had at least a very teeny tiny part in that. Um, so, yeah, people who, uh, you know, Jesus Florido, who toured with Cajun Plant from, from Led Zeppelin, he and Andrew Glasser had known about each other but had never met. And I get calls from these guys all the time, like, Jesus is like, ah, I was hanging out with Andrew Glasser the other day, and we're working on this thing. And so the, the meeting of people at this thing is so important. People that you've followed on social media for years but you've never met them in person uh, you get to uh, drink uh, uh, high C with them or whatever your preferred beverage of choice is when you're partying, some unsweet tea or whatever it is that you like. Um, so there will be some really awesome people. It's a week from this coming Friday, so what, nine days from today, in Anaheim from 7 to 9, Patrick Contreras is playing. Uh, it's going to be banging, so do not miss that, please. Um, 
just quit your job and fly to Anaheim and come do this thing. Um, I want to talk about a couple things that are happening um, at NAM. There is a product that we are going to be getting. We just talked to our boss rep the other day, and it's a uh, just so if you had some Christmas money you're thinking about spending, um, there's a thing called the Waza Air. Um, you guys know the Katana Amp series that we talk a lot about from Boss that are fantastic value, despite some guy that insisted on arguing with me on Facebook the other day. It's a fantastic amp for the price. I'm not going to compare it to, a, uh, to an acoustic image or anything, but it's like one-eighth of the price. Um, they, uh, they've got all kinds of effects built in and all this stuff to these Boss amps. So they have a new thing called the Waza Headphone. And it's a set of headphones, and it's a transmitter a lot like the Line 6 G10, a little bud-style transmitter. The transmitter goes into whatever you want, can go into your pedal board, can go into your instrument, whatever, and it, not Bluetooth, because Bluetooth has lots of latency, it goes um, radio frequency, RF, to your headphones. In the headphones are all the electronics from the Katana series. So it's got all your preamps, all the speakers, all the uh, effects, the reverb, the delay, the flangers, all that stuff is in the headphones. This is like the perfect practice rig. And it's all controllable from your phone. So there's a free app that goes on your phone. You can like turn stuff up and turn it down. Hey, give me some chorus, give me some reverb, give me some some A, some D, some D, I'm ADD, woo. Um, so you got all that in your phone and it can play MP3s off of your phone. So if you're like, hey, I'm gonna rock out to some autumn leaves, like we we're talking about, yeah, full circle. If I'm gonna practice, I'm gonna throw some autumn leaves, backing tracks in there, pop this thing into my instrument, pop the headphones on, everything's wireless. I'm just playing, bro. And all of my effects and stuff are going right into my headphones. Also, very exciting, there's a feature where you can say, okay, I want to have my sound coming from over there. So you look that way, you push the button, and then when you turn, and you turn, that sound is still coming from over here. It pans it in your headphones as you're turning your head. Like, how dope is that? Very cool. And, uh, and also, the whole thing's all battery-powered, everything's rechargeable, and the headphones that actually feel good and sound good are Bluetooth headphones. You can use them, say that you're flying out to Anaheim for the NAMM show, because you want to party with us at the Fiddle Hang, and you're in the airplane, and you want to uh, listen to Rockstar Violinist, because you're very, very smart. So you can just use them as Bluetooth headphones. Like, they're even better than Beats. Because beats, um, how much? I don't remember. But they're just a couple hundred bucks. They're not. They're not super expensive. What are they? Three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. Chris tells me. Um, uh, but for you guys, three ninety nine. Um, so yeah, it's they're they're not super cheap. But for what it is, it's basically it's your entire practice rig. And hey, you're probably going to spend almost that much on some on some decent Bluetooth headphones anyway. Um, so why not have one that helps you practice? And like I said, it doesn't have to plug into your instrument. It could plug into your pedal board. So you could use your pedal board to practice. You just put this thing at the output of your pedal train, and then you've got all your pedals down there. You can stomp and tap dance and put it on the end of your, uh, on the end of your looper and uh, all of that. Can't use it for live performance, unfortunately, um, but for the audience of one, you care about the most anyway. Um, there you go. So those are going to be at NAMM. Uh, I'm going to be hanging out at the Wood Violins booth quite a bit. I'll be hanging out at the NS Design booth quite a bit, at the 3D Various booth. Uh, I'll be at Daddario Strings. I'll be at Dogal Strings. Uh, iSolo, the company that makes the wireless microphones that we really, really like. Um, I'll be at their booth. Um, who else? Um, Let's see, Realist is going to be there. I'll be hanging out with the folks from Realist. Um, who else? I know I'm forgetting people. Boss, I'll be hanging at the Fishman booth. Um, who else? I'm trying to think who else is, is going to be there. Tons and tons of people. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to be at NAMM, uh, 
probably I generally spend the most time at, at any booth uh, is usually the wood violins booth. Um, I'm a wood violins guy, and so yeah. But I'll be playing at the woods violin wood violins booth on Friday and Saturday at four o'clock Pacific. I'll be playing at the three D various booth um, Saturday and Sunday at noon. Both of those. Um, we're gonna be meeting up with the Code Bow people out there. Yamaha I'll definitely spend a bunch of time at the Yamaha booth. Um, yeah, gosh, who else? I'm looking around to see who else is here. Um, yeah, all the cool people. It's going to be awesome. So, hey, thank you guys for tuning in. So if you've got uh, tips and tricks for making your practice time more efficient, please put those in the comments and share them. I will share that SoundCloud link that we talked about. Um, if you're going to be at NAM, hit me up. Um, if you, like I said, if you've got more comments on making your practice time more efficient, dump those in the comments section, share them with everybody. If you have ideas for topics for us to do a live stream on, that would be super awesome. Shoot those to me. And, uh, yeah, even if you want to write a, uh, if you want to write the, uh, outline for me, that'd be even better. Hey, my dad's here. What's up, dad? Um, so yeah, thank you guys for hanging out. No live stream next week, but... We may do a thing, like Raz suggested, after the fiddle hang, we're probably all going to be on the super high because just being around all these amazing players is so inspiring. Um, yeah, dude, Nam's amazing. Um, we may, Raz and I may get on, on the thing and do a, uh, we may do an AMA and ask me anything because uh, we're going to be on this total adrenaline high and uh, we may be... A little lubricated, so maybe our uh, our answers would be more entertaining than usual. Um, so yeah, maybe we'll do something like that after the fiddle hang. But um, I will not be here next Wednesday, and I won't be here the Wednesday after because I'm going to be hanging out with Andrew Glasser down in San Diego, and and I'm going to visit his factory in Tijuana, where they make the the Glasser violins, and uh, maybe I have some video for you from Tijuana. Maybe some of it will be of the uh, of the violin making. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for hanging out, and I will see you not next week, not the week after, but the following weeks. So what's that? Three weeks from today. All right. If you guys have ideas on stuff you want me to cover, that'd be awesome. I'll do my best. Okay. Peace.